the high plains of Kansas, and the northeast corner of the land of enchantment. It's Friday. The land of EWTN all across the Lone Star State. It's GRN Alive. Bringing you faith, fun, and facts. Live from the studios of the Guadalupe Radio Network. Join us on the show. Call 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. And good morning and welcome to GRN Alive here on this beautiful, beautiful Friday morning. And we are in the season of Lent. I hope your Lent is off to a good start. Ash Wednesday a couple of days ago. And so... It's penitential, and hopefully we're going to make the best of it as we march towards Holy Week, the Triduum, and Easter Sunday, the high feast day celebration of the uh, the Christian liturgical calendar. So it's an awesome time to be a Catholic. And this is GRN Alive. We do this twice a week, Mondays from Houston with Joe and the crew, and then on Friday mornings we do it here in our North Texas office and uh, studio. And uh, we're glad you're with us. The phone number, if you want to be a part of the show today, is 877-757-9424, 877-757-9424. As that intro kind of highlights, we broadcast across a, a good swath of the United States and Texas and New Mexico and Kansas and Florida. You like that word, swath, Sizzle? <laughs> I was thinking about that, and I'm wondering if I had ever heard that. Is that That is an actual word. Oh, oh yes. Okay, I just want to make sure. I, I only use actual oh, words. Oh. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, Dave. I'm pretty sure you haven't before. Yeah, no, no. A swath of the country. Yeah, I so, guess so. I have. I just, I struck I me for it. a minute. All it made right. me think of pirates for some reason. <laughs> sorry. Continue. Right. I'm so sorry. That's Cicely Anderson. Or the she... scythe of the Grim Reaper. The Ooh, scythe. that's a good yeah, one. I like that. An swath actual word. Swath and scythe. <laughs> swath and scythe. Uh, so we also are broadcasting this morning, as usual, on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Diane Xavier just does an exemplary job. Even if you can't watch it live on Facebook, go back and watch it because the images that she pops up and the links that she provides, it really does uh, uh, help and uh, uh, you know just kind of adds to the to the overall experience of the broadcast, okay? Plus, you get to see, uh, see us and not just hear us. And uh, Dr. Chris Malloy is a professor of theology at the University of Dallas. He is the author of uh, TheologicalFlint.com, and I actually checked that out. And uh, your most recent uh, uh, article is Bellarmine is the Man. I is like that. The is man. the man. St. Yeah. Bellarmine, good Jesuit uh, yep. priest, doctor of the church, right? Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So he wrote a book on, uh, well, he translated Purgatory. Uh, Purgatory. Okay. Yeah, John Grant translated Me- Mediatric Press. And uh, at any rate, it's great to read Bellarmine on Purgatory. Just fantastic. Yeah, I also like how you're posting the audio of this segment of the show yes. and then adding a little extra commentary That's right. on it. And so if people want to go deeper, there's two ways to go deeper, okay? Oh, there's more than two ways. But you can also listen to the after show because uh, we go a little bit, you know, by that time, you're you're off to your, off your regular gig. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But we, we talk in a little bit more informal way about the topics we talked about. Uh, Daniel DeMore joins us uh, and uh, Corsiso and Diane. So anyways, we invite you to stay on. Facebook and Twitter and YouTube after the program as well. And don't forget uh, Dr. Malloy's uh, blog, TheologicalFlint.com. It's uh, got some interesting uh, information. And so, you know, we have a sponsor of Guadalupe Radio Network called Solidarity Health Share, and their CEO, CEO is Brad Hahn. And every now and then, You, you it's your work. You, but, yeah, but it's your work, too. I mean, you're on a radio show, so you should ask your, well, there you go. your fraternity. You, if well, can. if you give me an absolution, <laughs> then... <laughs> <laughs> it is granted, young man. Uh, uh, but anyways, Medicare for like All, young... socialized medicine came up, and uh, uh, Brad Hahn's going to talk about that. We talked about it last week uh, with our guest about socialism and whether Catholics can be socialists. And so kind of going to continue that topic, but specifically about socialized medicine. And Brad Hahn, I, I guarantee, is going to say it's not not a good thing for this country. And so he'll join us about 40 after. And, uh, you know, our, our next, uh, our first guest is some guy named Patrick Coffin. Uh, hmm.
UK, it's 71. <laughs> so, so the UK has more genders. <laughs> Time you, to move. Wow. Do you realize yeah. that? That's craziness, okay? Disney's about to release its first... Uh, I think it's two in Poland. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just two. Wow, they are so backwards, aren't they? Uh. Gosh, what's wrong with Poland? There's only Christ two? is king there, too. Yeah, amen. I'm kidding, yeah. So uh, Disney's about to uh, release a movie called Onward. First openly homosexual character uh, in their movie. Mm. Openly. They've been kind of, you know, flirting with... I didn't with realize it. that. I'm so out of touch, apparently. Um, yeah, wow. got a guy, a, a Jesuit priest, uh, Father James Martin, we've talked about on the show a lot, uh, openly espousing the LGBT agenda, seemingly without much correction. Okay, uh, we have a socialist and an openly homosexual candidate running for president. Uh, the idea of uh, sexuality didn't even come up in the debates. It's just kind of like a given, like this isn't any big deal. Those are two distinct candidates, though. Yeah, correct, that's yes, right, so. two distinct candidates. And, and to be fair, we also have a thrice-married uh, current president right. yeah, whose first two wives are still alive. Yeah. And so, you know, we got to be fair. There's, there's uh, issues on both sides. Dennis Prager wrote an article recently about the decay of America, and he, he pointed to the decline of the family. Uh, the end of right and wrong, the end of religion, the end of beauty. These are some of the broad topics he talked about. So Patrick Coffin's going to talk about, you know, from a historical, was there, was, there a, was there a catalyst? Was there a point where everything just kind of started spiraling downward? Or uh, I, I don't think there was one thing. But well, one uh, thing I could recommend to the, uh, to the readers is they, they read a book called Liberalism is a Sin by Father Felix Sarda y Salvani. And, um, it, it, okay, in the preface there, it was written in the 90s, and he's asking the same question. And he says, look, recently you've had a cultural collapse, but the, the roots of it go, go back programmatically, let's say, to the Reformation. Yeah. But the, you can also just point to the fact that we're human, and we tend to be like water. We want the easiest and the most pleasant way. Yeah. And so, in a way, it's like, well, we've got technologies to make things easier, uh, yes, there are. So I think that there's two things. One is there's we're human, and sin is uh, something we do. <laughs> yeah. The other yeah. thing is there are uh, the, the Protestant Reformation is kind of a break. Let's break from the church. Let's get our own freedom. The Enlightenment takes it to another level. Liberalism, my freedom, my individualism, not the community, not the common good, and that, so the church gets pushed further and further. So fine, but most people keep decent mor morality going, mm -hmm. right? That's what the yeah. preface to this book says. They keep decent morality going because they know it, it hurts them. But in the last forty years, say twenty years, that it has been an utter collapse. It's like you can't. The ideas that were bad have finally taken root in our yeah. wills. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about. But I'm interested we, in seeing what Dr. Coffin says. That'll yeah, be... yeah, so Patrick's going to talk about that, and uh, he, he's, a, he's, he's a, a student of history. Yeah, he, he's been and, looking at this. And he really has, and again, the Lambeth Conference, that's something that I, yeah. I find very interesting. 1930, over yep. in the Anglican Church, they said, you know, it, only inside marriage, only certain circumstances, contraception's okay. And it was very, it was controversial over there at the time, but that really, that, that wasn't good. No. And that, that started, and, and, and again, con, um, Patrick writes a lot about contraception, right? In, in fact, his recent book is called The Contraception Deception. They, they so, knew they had to get contraception before abortion. Yeah. And there, it was all a, st An agenda, a, a step yeah. towards it, okay? so Divorce anyway. was in the background, too. The yeah. French Revolution. Yeah, yeah, that's another one. The, one of those uh, flashpoints of history is the French Revolution. There, and there's other one, the um, the Enlightenment. Of course, that yeah. wasn't one event. But anyways, uh, that's what we're talking about. And we want you to join in and speak with us, uh, dear listener, if you want to chime in on this conversation, 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. I've already fallen behind, so real quickly, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> buy car raffle tickets, because next week on this show, we're going to be drawing the winner of a... And alive. Here is Cecil Anderson with the news. 
Good morning, GRN listeners. Japan plans to pu- uh, close all public schools for at least a month starting on uh, next week. The Prime Minister Shinzo Abe made the decision due to the continued outbreak of coronavirus cases in the country, the number of cases rising to 197 this week. The move to shut down school- schools would make Japan one of the few countries, including China, to suspend classes nationwide. Meanwhile, the Vatican is also taking extra health precautions, including the cancellation of a few public events, now that the confirmed cases in Italy has reached 528. Former Vice President Joe Biden has picked up some momentum in his presidential campaign with a new poll putting him in lead and a significant lead in North Carolina. This is a change from Bernie Sanders, who's held the top position in recent primary polls, including in California, Massachusetts, and Utah. The campaign of Marie Newman, a Democratic candidate running for a primary against Representative Dan Lim- Limsky in Illinois' 3rd Congressional District posted a video on Twitter Wednesday featuring two religious sisters, sisters uh, Patricia Murphy and Joanne Persh of the Sisters of Mercy, endorsing Newman's bid for Congress. Lipinski, a Catholic himself, is an eight-term member of Congress and widely known as one of the few remaining pro-life Democrats in in a federal office. He has worked across the aisle to support pro-life measures, including signing a petition to force a vote on the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, which would require medical care for infants who survive a botched abortion attempt. In a statement on Thursday, the Institute of the Sisters of Mercy of the Americas said it does not endorse any political candidates. The statement read, quote, political endorsements made by an individual sister represents their own personal views, unquote. With the news, this is Cecil Anderson. All right. Thank you so much, Cecil. And it is now 11 minutes after the hour. I'll tell you what, we were going to take a quick break now. We're just not going to do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get uh, Patrick on the line. Uh, and if that's all right, Cecil, thanks for the news. And uh, Patrick Hoffman is going to join us in just a second. I just want to remind you the phone number because uh, we want to know what you have to say. This has got to be something on your mind as you look around the culture and say, wow, you know, th- the train is kind of running off the tracks a little bit here. What, where did this start? What happened? 877 757 9424 877-757-9424. And uh, again, Patrick Coffin is the founder of Patrick Coffin Media. He's the host of The Patrick Coffin Show. Uh, he is found at patrickcoffin.media, and also uh, he has a website uh, as well called coffinnation.com. Okay, and coffin is C-O-F-F-I-N, like the thing that uh, you, you're, you're buried in, a coffin, not like the <coughs> that kind of cough. Remember right. death. Uh, yes, yes, he's got to remember it every day because his very name uh, has to do with it, right? It's uplifting. Um, Uh, He's written two books, uh, Sex au Naturel and also The Contraception Deception. Uh, He offers a comprehensive assessment.
prison. He was homosexual himself. He was a drug abuser. And that's a whole other story of, of Alfred Kinsey. But he's really the father of the sexual revolution. And that was as early as 1948. When did in that 19, get exposed? In, when, when was that book published? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, Judith Reisman published a book called Kinsey, Sex, and Fraud in 1989. Wow. Okay. And she's, uh, she's going to be speaking at our conference out here in Southern California. I think she's an absolute prophet, very courageous lady. And um, after, the, after the, those books were published, they were uh, accompanied by a lot of hurrah, a lot of um, people. It, it got their attention, including uh, a young man by the name of Hugh Hefner, who told Kinsey that he wanted to be his pamphleteer. So in 1953, you have the first edition of Playboy that comes out featuring Marilyn Monroe in the cover. Uh, Marilyn Monroe is now buried next to Hugh Hefner out in Los Angeles. I didn't know that. Ironically, they, those two never met. Hugh Hefner never met Marilyn Monroe. Wow. In fact, he, pur- he purloined those photos in the magazine without her permission. That's another backstory most people oh. are not aware. Wow. It, so then it, you keep going. Go ahead. Oh no, no. I, I'm sorry. I you said keep going. I, I'm, I find it interesting, and I know you, you're not implying that it all began in 1948 uh, with, with you know. But I, I, I thought that you might even uh, go back a little earlier to Lambeth Conference, and I, I had a little bit of inference the, the 1930 Lambeth Conference. I know there have been a number of them, but uh, would this be a good time to yes. mention that? Because uh, there's a yeah. couple, couple things, and I, I know, think so. I, I know, especially with as much as you write about contraception, uh, just for those who don't know, Lambeth Conference uh, is a series of conferences in the Anglican Church. They actually had one, interestingly, in 1948 as well, but uh, uh, Resolution 15 from the 1930 Lambeth Conference basically Mm -hmm. allowed, under certain circumstances, uh, contraception within marriage. What I I find interesting, Patrick, is that in uh, June 30th, 1930, the London Times predicted that the Lambeth Conference would change the social and moral life of humanity— uh, and mm-hmm. interestingly, also, Resolution 16 of that same conference expressed abhorrence of the sinful practice of abortion. Resolution 18 reckoned, quote, Thirty, yes, with that Lambeth decision, which for the first time in Christian history created a crack in the dam. The, the very first Christian acceptance, acceptance of contraception, as you say, was by the Anglican bishops that summer, August of 1930. You could go back to the Enlightenment. You could go back to the Council of Trent, to the East-West split. You could go back to Adam and Eve. Um, but I, I think you're right that you could say one more thing about pre-Kinsey history, and that is the Christian acceptance of contraception. And within 10 or 15 years, uh, the entire Protestant world had caved on the question of whether or not love and life belong together. And, uh, but it was really, I, I, I think you can draw a straight line from 1930 to 1968 with the release of Humana Vitae by St. Paul VI, and how the timing of the document, the, uh, the fact that, uh, sadly, too many church leaders did not discipline theologians and priests who were dissenting, and it really got out of out of second gear in 1968 with uh, with the widespread dissent from really a teaching that was not, was not specifically Catholic. You look at uh, people as diverse as Sigmund Freud, um, George Eliot, who was a uh, anti-Catholic, you know, the guy who wrote uh, no George that was the poet George Orwell, author mm-hmm. of 1984. He was anti-birth control. Um, none other than Raquel Welch wrote an essay in uh, in uh, probably 2010 against contraception. Uh, so you've got Freud, you've got Gandhi. All these people are united in agreeing with the Catholic Church about this anthropological question: Is it okay to subvert the act that God has designed for the uh, procreation of new people and the bonding of spouses? The Catholic Church still says no, and now you know you find this. Uh, uh, growing opposition to the church. We're really the only church left in the world that believes that contraception is wrong. And I think the as the sexual revolution spirals more and more out of control, I think people are revisiting that, that wisdom. It's biblical, it's historical, it goes back to apostolic times, and it's part of Orthodox Judaism before Christ came. 
And you've got the so, so, so yeah. you're, you would say that the Orthodox are by and large uh, not uh, they're they're not condemnatory of it. There's no unanimity in the Orthodox churches, capital L. No, they have caved on the contraception question, in addition to divorce and remarriage, because they don't have a pope, right? They don't have a living shepherd to um, to coalesce around Scripture and to interpret it correctly. And so that's an, another fallout of of departing from from Peter. Do you um, think? Can I ask? Yeah. Uh, but post World War II, the um, the men who went there, um, they were able to suffer. They knew suffering. I've heard the narrative mm-hmm. that they came back and they said, "Our children will not suffer," and that that's a basic Epicurean uh, thesis. It's not a hedonist thesis, but it's an Epicurean thesis. Uh, suffering is the greatest evil which essentially kind of maps onto s- sensitive goods, physical goods and evils are where you should really put your primary evaluation. Is that involved at all, do you think? I think that can be a layer of it. I hadn't thought of it in those terms. Um, when World War II was over in 1945 and the fighting men came back home, they were left to figure out, okay, well, we won, now what? Beyond the white picket fence and the and the fancy lawn, and you know the the uh, time saving. <laughs> remember all those time life commercials about yeah. new vacuum cleaners and everything is a time saving device. I think an existential crisis came with that. Like, what's what am I what am I existing for? Okay, we've we've we beat back the Japanese, we beat back Germans, but here we are in, in suburban America, and now what? And uh, if you don't have an enemy then you start to ponder life itself. And I think a certain ennui set in to American culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was no more population displacement in Europe, so things began to settle down a little bit. And uh, I think Americans had a lot of time on their hands. And a lot of the next generation took the, the sacrifices of the greatest generation for granted. And, you know, most people now, they, the number of uh, people who were in the Vietnam conflict are getting fewer and fewer. So this is all the more important to learn history. Let me give out the phone number if anybody wants yeah. to jump in. My guest is Patrick Coffin, founder of Patrick Coffin Media, host of The Patrick Coffin Show, patrickcoffin.media, and also coffinnation.com or his websites. His most recent book is called The Contraception Deception. Phone number is 877-757-9424. For and uh, you know, I as we talk, and I, I think the interesting uh, what Dr. Malloy said about uh, kind of the Epicurean angle to it, and I say, okay, so Lambeth Conference says contraception's okay. We've got Griswold versus Connecticut, 1965, Roe v. Wade. We're starting to lax moral laws, but today, when it's gender confusion and pronouns, and you know, men in women's restrooms, and just kind of crazy off-the-track stuff, especially with the pronouns. I just think, like, what, is that a natural, you know, you, you go from contraception, abortion, and then the sodomy law is overturned, and now we don't even know if there's he's or she's or they's. I mean, how, how did that happen? I, I, maybe that's a little less of a softball question, Patrick. Well, I think it is all a natural outgrowth of the, and I'll use this word on purpose, the decoupling of love and life in the sex act. If it's open to sterilize what God has made a sterile, uh, excuse me, a fertile act, then the logic is inexorable. You can't argue against other sexual perversions if you're going to say that that the the two in one flesh of marriage is now up, up for re- radical reinterpretation. So you have the the issuing of Humana Vitae in the summer of 1968. Within seven years, you had Roe v. Wade, because you need a backup plan. If your acts of contraception fail, then you need a safety net, and that safety net is called abortion. And so from 1973 uh, all the way up to 2015 with the Obergefell versus Hodges decision, which uh, redefined marriage for the first time in American history uh, in 2015, of course you're going to have to redefine marriage because you redefine what sex means, which means you redefine what a man is and what a woman is. So it's all emerging from that single Pandora's box of the, uh, the uh, uncoupling of love from life and the decision to sterilize what is ordinarily a fertile act. I think that's the, that's the taproot. Hmm. 
Interesting. You know, I, I can't uh, I can't help but think. Okay, we've 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 touched on pretty much modern history. I don't think we've even talked about anything that was beyond the the the, the, the 20th century. But you got to go back. I'm I'm thinking going back all the way to Rene Descartes. You know, what about the the, mm-hmm. the, the Protestant? That, you were inviting that with your it, opening uh, yeah, remark. Yeah. Patrick. yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Um, uh, but can I say? Can I one more thing? And it's you know a segue maybe to the Descartes thing is. How lonely. I mean, pleasure, just qua pleasure, is just your, as it were, imminent sensation. And if that's mm-hmm. what we're gunning for, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I don't know if we had children listening, I hope, but at any rate, but it's a solitary, you know, the self-abuse. Um, and uh, that it's just no good. It's just me. It's not the other. I'm losing sight. So it starts with the love, to couple love from life, but it's not even love. It's just me. You know, in the mm-hmm. it seems in the end. Yeah, love has been redefined as a narcissistic subjective feeling. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I sense, therefore I am. I feel, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. So, the the objectivity of God and His law has been replaced by, um, you know, love means love, and the 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 triumph of the individual rights over against everything else. And and that's I think another thing that came with this this Cartesian hangover is the belief that pleasure is bad and, uh, excuse me, yeah, pleasure, the the other way around, Freudian slip, pleasure is good and pain is bad. So if you have something painful in your life, then your highest good is to remove it. And if there's something pleasurable, then the goal here is to maximize it. It's very Jeremy Bentham, utilitarian, Rene Descartes. Well, that's, that's the first step to chaos, because some pains can save your life, like surgery. Yeah. And some pleasures can kill you, like drug addiction. So that's um, a very worldly way of looking at what are really uh, internal uh, sensate experiences. Does that does that make sense? Absolutely, sense? it does. Yeah. Uh, we got some calls coming in eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four. I just love this topic as it touches on philosophy, history, the church, and so much, and, and our culture. I mean, we're we're all bathing in the culture and the the modern zeitgeist, and uh, a lot of us are thinking, "Gosh, something is just not right." Uh, our guest is Patrick Coffin, the host of the Patrick Coffin Show. You can find him at coffinnation.com. And he's got a lot of this on that website. We'll ask him about that. Also want to talk about the solution. I I tend to think, well, I I have my opinions, but we'll talk about that. Uh, First call is Bob listening in Houston. Bob, thank you for uh, calling in this morning. What is your question or comment for Patrick Hoffman? Yes, uh, Patrick. Hey, Bob. uh, Hi. You know, uh, I'm a Catholic, a practicing Catholic, and um, right in tune with everything that uh, we espouse regarding the, you know, the way we should be living and uh, the whole idea about uh, uh, how sex should be uh, handled and, you know, uh, just uh, generally accepting uh, the Catholic teachings regarding that. Mm-hmm. The problem that I, I run into is that uh, when it comes to your home, all of a sudden things aren't as clear as they are when we discuss it on the radio or discuss it with other people, friends. So in our case, we have a nephew that uh, uh, is gay and ended up getting married. Uh, So we've got a a same-sex marriage in our family, and we had to deal with issues. Do we go to the wedding? you know, when we see him, uh, I see him two or three times a year. Uh, uh, how do how we relate? We have to. It's almost like you have to throw that all those ideas out of your mind and just treat him and love him and and uh, you know uh, care for them as if there was no problem. Yeah. But yet there is a problem. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, yeah, Bob. Yeah, Bob so, let, let's let let's let Patrick. Yeah, yeah. I think we get the the gist of it, Bob. Thank you for the. That's a good question, yeah. Bob, Bob. Patrick, what do you think? Yeah. Well, Bob is touching on an issue that a lot of list, people listening right now are dealing with, and that is the uh, the meeting of the teaching of the church and natural law with the subjective experience of someone that you care about. And if those two are in conflict, then it becomes a very a, a deep, pressing challenge. To, yes. to both be truthful and loving, truthful and loving. Yes. If you're, if you've got truth 
but no love, then you're just cruel. If you've got love with no truth, then you're just a sentimentalist. So right. Catholics have to find a way to do both. Um, there's a couple of presuppositions there, Bob. I'm not, I'm not picking on you because we, we've fallen into a way of describing this that I think is a little bit inaccurate. One, one is no one is gay. Okay, there, there's no such thing as an ontological category made by God that you are this way. Um, mm-hmm. People are complex, they're beautiful, they have dignity, they're much more than the sum total of their sexual urges. And there's a whole community of people that you never learn much about uh, who found chastity through repentance, through the hard work of therapy, through working back uh, into the, the wounds of their childhood. So there is a way out of the lifestyle if you're knocking and searching and, and, you know, hungering for the fullness of truth. Secondly, there's no such thing as gay marriage. Like people who stand before a judge, uh, and, and pronounce vows are not objectively marriage, married, I should say. Mm -hmm. So marriage is the union of one man and one woman, uh, with till death do your part. That's what marriage is. So I think Catholics need to, to recalibrate the way they talk about this and not say, well, there's gay marriage, there's traditional marriage, there's real marriage, because that splinterizes the whole thing and makes everybody confused. Marriage is what it is. It has a definition that's over 5,000 years old. It predates Christianity. It, it's you know outside Judaism. Uh, Ryan Anderson is a very uh, eloquent spokesman on this. I'd recommend his book, Man and Woman in Defense. Um, but yeah, Bob, yes, Jesus loves your nephew. Uh, Jesus died for for all of us, and he gives us enough grace that we can live out the plan of his Heavenly Father, whether it's through our sexuality or whether it's through our generosity or our willingness to forgive other people. But I, I always encourage people, do both. You know, express, this is, this is our view as Catholics. You're always welcome here. I mean, that families are going to make various decisions if, the, if it involves children and so on. I, I don't think there's a, a template approach for all families who have homosexual um, relatives. But um, just try to keep the door open. And if they, if they take offense or if they get you know, uh, angry, there's really not a lot you can do to control that. Bob, thanks for the, uh, the call. We've got to move on. Um, and uh, appreciate you listening in Houston there. Uh, Patrick, you know, some of the things <clears throat> you just said, it, it made me think that if you were working in a major corporation in America, they would immediately have to send you to sensitivity training, because I, I just, I don't know, some of those things you said just didn't sound like, uh, they, like they were right. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, we're in a very, uh, with, with um, employment laws and local codes and what, what used to be called community standards, the idea that homosexual behavior is anything other than, than fabulous and wonderful is total heresy. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is an invitation to for Catholics to be who they are. Yeah. If um, anything, can I ask you this? Uh, yeah. Unless we have callers, this whole labeling of a normal approach to sexuality as breeding, if anything, not sure. only is it fabulous and beautiful, but the culture's going to be saying it's the way to go. Either the solitary act or homosexuality is the way to go because yeah. heterosexuality gives us more of these nasty crying kids. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's Gnosticism. It's yep, uh, manichaeism. Right. Yeah, sex sex is sex is bad. You're you're a breeder. Or here's a here's a new invented word salad term that kills me: cis male. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, cis. wait a second. That that's code for normal. That's How is it that a tiny minority of radicals have redefined what normal masculine just, and feminine with a nasty is? word? Like, is this male somebody that actually yeah. is having is breeding? Is that what it is? Or uh, yeah, cis male is a heterosexual, oh, red blooded. Okay. Yeah, hey, yes, hey, uh, that's cis male. Patrick, let me go, let me go. We have, we have uh, John, John calling in. He's uh, got a question on contraception, which I think you know a thing or two yeah. about. Uh, so let's go to John in Houston. Uh, I presume listening to KSHJ fourteen thirty a.m. John, uh, got to be kind of quick with your question because uh, we're running out of time. But thank you very much for calling. What's your question or comment for Patrick? Uh, it's, a, it's a question or comment. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, my wife hey, and I—we just had our third child recently, about a month ago. Congratulations! Uh, thank you. Yeah. It's a, um, really blessed uh but you know we were thinking uh, last night we we went out um uh and um but our my mom uh took care of our child and we've got uh the two boys uh and they're 
you know, very energetic. But I was reflecting on how both of us that if we didn't have my parents who are retired to come and help, how difficult it would be to resist that desire to, to, to use contraception as a way to, you know, um, defer having children uh, because of the difficulties. Like we're a two income household. We both have to work. Um, I was telling her, like, I wish, like, you know, one of us could just take time off and just take care of the kids. It's, it's important to us that they, um, they grow up in the faith and that um, mm-hmm. they have great instruction from us. But you know, if I didn't, I, I was, I was just t- t- um, thinking out loud to her that if we didn't have my parents, it would be so difficult to resist that uh, temptation to just use contraception so we don't have um, any more kids. John, John, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Well, it's Lent, John. And once again, congratulations. Because we're all going to die. And to dust we shall return. And this life, I mean, here we are. It's February 28th, 2020. Uh, I can't believe we've already got to this moment. It's all going so quickly. This life here below is so, it's so fragile and it's so brief. I think we have to have a supernatural perspective on our marriages and what our marriages are for and our generosity with the great gift of fertility. And I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here. But I think the, the automatic assumption that you must be a two-income family needs to be given a second look. I'm not saying that it is, I'm not saying it's intrinsically wrong, anything like that. But when you're talking about a family tree being changed forever, I think we have to realize that on the one hand, contraception is intrinsically wrong. On the other hand, it's not the teaching of the church that you have to have a, I hear this a lot, grave reasons. That is a, a mistranslation of the language of Casti Canubi from 1930 and Humana Vitae from 1968. The church's teaching is that you need a just or serious reason to delay, contra- uh, to delay um, conception, which means there could be legitimate reasons. The church doesn't give a list because every couple is different. You have to discern things on a case-by-case basis. But the idea that you have to go into, you know, rank poverty um, is not the teaching of the church. And, and Patrick, hey, you're look, talking about natural yeah. family planning, of course, right? And the, and the difference yeah, between contraception. Planning, yeah. yeah. Hey, John, thanks for the call. Appreciate you listening there in Houston. And we're down to our last two minutes with Patrick Coffin. And so we want to kind of um, wrap this up. And, of course, we're talking about how we got to where we are today. And, uh, and I will mention, you know, uh, in, in North Texas, Patrick's coming in uh, March 27th and 28th for this Courageous Truth Conference. And I think it's so great that we teach young people uh, the, these truths of the Catholic Church. And so, uh, Patrick, anything else you want to say? Direct people to your, your website or, or anything else, your book, that to, before we wrap things up with you? Sure, Dave. Well, thanks. I'm a little bit jealous because you, you used the word zeitgeist before I did. So, <laughs> so kudos. <laughs> kudos. Yeah. Um, CourageousTruth.org is the website. Um, I'm pretty sure it's going to sell out as it did last year. I'm honored to be part of this uh, important mission to, to give the whole truth to um, Catholics, especially young Catholics, were made to hear the fullness of truth. And if I could, this is the kind of thing we talk about all the time inside Coffin Nation. It's a, it's an online. We're going to hold our first meetup conference in Southern California in November. So if folks want to go to CoffinNation.com, they can click on the trailer and and find out what it's all about. Because we're we're made for the truth. The truth will set us free. And um, love being Catholic. All right. Amen. Patrick, always great to talk to you. Appreciate it very much. Again, the new book is called The Contraception Deception by Patrick Coffin, C-O-F-F-I-N, his website, coffinnation.com. Patrick, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Malloy. Thanks, David. You as well. Thanks, Patrick. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, All right. Uh, Well, hey, good seeing you. Great to see you. Hope class goes well. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Ciao. Be drawn for the winner, that uh, that winner of the 2020 Cadillac CT5. And we've got one more segment on the program. And again, thanks for the calls. So, oh, two calls from Houston. That's awesome. Uh, you're always welcome to call in 877-757-9424. Got another interesting topic. I, I've been watching these uh, debates. Uh,
them, and this especially as uh, they debate socialism within the Democratic Party. And one of the things that they talk about is this uh, socialized medicine, uh, Medicare for all. And uh, we're going to come back and talk to Brad Hahn from Solidarity Health Share. And he has an alternative, and we're going to talk about uh, what's wrong with, you know, single-payer socialized medicine. Uh, why is that a bad idea for our country, especially for Catholics? So Brad Hahn joins us uh, with Solidarity Health Share to talk about that right after this break. Amy is a real GRN listener, and so to help tell her story about buying a GRN raffle ticket, we hired an impersonator of LSU football coach Ed Ogeron. When my husband and I found out we could support the GRN by buying a raffle ticket to win the new Cadillac CT5 luxury, we called 888-784-3476 and bought five tickets for $100. That's the best deal in America. Later, my husband surprised me by buying even more tickets by going to grnonline.com. He a good man. Go Tigers. Catholic Radio was there for me when I needed it. Even though I didn't think I needed it, it was there for me. I want everybody to know that I'm giving, not so that I can sit there and say that I gave the GRN for any other reason but this. I want that radio station to be there for anyone else who needs it also. They may not think they need it, but it's going to be there for them, whether it's in the future, whether it's right now. I want that radio station to always be there for them, just like it was there for me. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. The fourth promise the Founders made in 1996 was to promote holy vocations. What is meant by the word promote? It is defined as to further the progress of, to support, or to actively encourage. That is exactly what the GRN has been doing and is doing now. Through our programming, we are supporting the faith journey of men and women who are in the process of discerning a religious vocation or who are living a priestly or religious vocation now. The GRN believes that all vocations are called to holiness and that by hearing inspiring and faithful Catholic programming, people of all vocations can live a richer faith, including supporting those in religious and priestly vocations to live their vocations to the fullest. With your ongoing prayers and support, the GRN will always be here to promote holy vocations. This is Len Oswald, President of the GRN, with your GRN Family Minute. And we are back. This is GRN Alive here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for the calls. Always love when you uh, participate in the program. Of course, if you're listening, you're participating, but uh, call in or make comments on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. We appreciate it very much. 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. One of our longtime sponsors is Solidarity HealthShare. They're located at SolidarityHealthShare.org. Their uh, CEO is Brad Hawk. basis to talk about things related to health care and also tell us about Solidarity Health Share. Got an interesting topic today. According to leading Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, quote, every study has shown a single payer Medicare for all system will save taxpayers money. Uh, the Vermont senator is now facing major scrutiny after making that claim during this recent Tuesday's primary debate in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. Uh, Sanders cited a recent study published in a medical journal called The Lancet, which determined that his plan would cost $450 billion less in a year than the current system, or $17 trillion over 10 years, a lot lower than the $40 trillion estimated by other studies. Uh, many experts are disputing Sanders' claim, including our guest Brad Hahn, founder and CEO of Solidarity HealthShare. It's a Catholic Christian nonprofit health sharing ministry that offers ethical, affordable alternatives to traditional health insurance. And we welcome Brad Hahn to GRN Alive. Brad Hahn, how you doing? Good morning. Yes, good morning, Dave. All right, so just kind of an open-ended question. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you're watching these debates, especially when they start talking about health care. You, your ears perk up and you, you tune in uh, cl very clearly. What do you make of these claims about, uh, you know, this being a more affordable, Medicare for all, socialized medicine uh, from Bernie Sanders and others of his ilk? Well, it's just, uh, it's a, just a completely false claim, Dave. And so some of the studies I've been looking at and some, some very well-known think tanks in Washington, D.C., you know, they're estimating that it could be as high as $60 trillion over the next 10 years. And how they're going to pay for this is um, by raising our taxes. And so some of the proposals there are looking to raise the FICA, you know, the withholding tax you see in your payroll every two weeks on your paycheck uh, by 21 percent. 
So if you have to raise your payroll taxes by 21%, I don't know how this is going to be less expensive for the uh, for the average American. Yeah, and it's interesting when he was kind of pressed on some of the funding for his policies during the debate, uh, you know, the the moderator said, you know, how are you going to pay for it? And he said, how, you know, how many hours do you have for me to explain it? And she said two, <laughs> which was yeah. the length of the debate. And that was kind of his way of dismissing the question, like, well, it's, it's too, which to me is kind of, well, if it's that complicated that you need hours to explain it, I, I think this may not be a great idea. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we're seeing is it's uh, that ship has sailed where you can just blindly trust a government takeover or a government hijacking of an industry. And that's basically what this would be. So a Medicare for all, not only would it be a disaster uh, financially for the average American and and the taxpayers in this country, it would also do away with a lot of the conscience protection uh, that we have under health care. You know, like the Weldon Amendment, the Hyde Amendment, those would all go away. So now you could also say not only would Medicare all be more expensive, Medicare for all would also translate in abortions for all. So there would be no protections and no conscience protections, and we would be directly funding abortions and other you know, immoral activities through our health care. Yeah, the website is SolidarityHealthShare.org. If you have a question for Brad Hahn about socialized medicine, med- Medicare for all, anything related to politics and medicine or health care, 877 757 Nine four two four eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four. Uh, you know, Brad. Uh, you, you know, you you're in this on a day to day basis. Some of us uh, on the on the outside looking in get confused with some of the terminology when we talk about Medicare for all, single payer, Obamacare, socialized medicine. Uh, kind of define some of these terms, and uh, yeah, maybe as they relate to this being an election year. Well, I think a lot of those terms relate to who's going to pay for the medical care in this country, you know, whatever they want to call it, socialized medicine. But if you look at that, every one of those definitions, they all steer to the federal government paying for health care. And the federal government doesn't have money, Dave, as you know. You know, we get, yeah. they get the money from the taxpayers and the Treasury. And so I think the better question to be asking the, the elected officials is not who's going to pay for the health care, but let's fix the, fix the broken payer system we have right now where the average American, even the providers, the, the doctors, you know, the hospital systems and the insurance companies, they have no idea what a procedure costs in healthcare these days. And so that's what we really need to be pushing for is transparency in billing. So I'll give you an example. Uh, my son was at the emergency room last summer and we've been asking the, uh, the hospital to send us an itemized bill. And they sent us a bill for $8,000 that basically says emergency room consultation. Uh, we're refusing to pay it. You know, until we get an itemized bill to see exactly what we're paying for, I'm not going to just blindly write a check for $8,000 to, uh, to a, a nonprofit hospital system. They need to prove to me what they did. And, and you know, the, the, the question a lot of people ask is, you know, why does healthcare have to be so expensive? And that was an example that you're talking about from your own family life. And, you know, I, I guess no system is perfect, and, uh, but a lot of people are just totally crippled by expenses in healthcare, as you mentioned. So, uh, is and I understand you know doctors need to be paid and there's equipment and uh, things that have to go into healthcare. But uh, d- is it necessary that it needs to be this expensive? Uh, no, it's not, and it's because it's a complete guessing game when it comes to what what uh, pricing is in the in healthcare. And all you have to do is look at to the point you know President Trump has been really pushing through regulations at the federal level for more transparent pricing, where hospital systems providers need to start publishing their their rates you know, so we can make a good informed decision as a consumer. So who are the first people that uh, file a lawsuit to enjoin those regulations? It's the big hospital systems and the insurance companies. So right there, those two big uh, entities that have a lot of power in in Washington, D.C. and at the state level, they don't want us to know what things actually cost. And I'll give you an example. Um, You know, last year for our members of Solidarity, uh, we had over $40 million worth of medical bills submitted. And we're able to get about a 60% discount just by negotiating with these providers. And so actually our families only had a share in about $18.8 million worth of medical expenses by on behalf of negotiating for them. But still, that's a, that's a huge, huge difference. And that's all it is, is just demanding transparency. Now, that can come as a cost because if you start fighting with the, insur- with the hospital system, they're going to threaten to send you to collections, and you just got to keep pushing back and say, don't send me to collections. You're, it's an issue with the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. You can't send me to collections. Give me a fair and reasonable price, 
and we'll make sure this this uh, we'll make sure that this is paid. But we're not going to allow um, the healthcare industry to just to run over our members and charge somewhere and sometimes a thousand percent what Medicare would pay for the same procedure. Yeah. Phone number 877-757-9424, 877-757-9424. Down to our last uh, oh, six or seven minutes with Brad Hahn. He's CEO of Solidarity HealthShare. They're located at uh, SolidarityHealthShare.org. Uh, it's a uh, health care sharing as an alternative to tradi- traditional health insurance. It's simple, affordable, and ethical health care that allows you and your family to get the care you need to stay healthy. You know, we, we, we talk about ethical health care, and a lot of people just kind of, when we we talk about socialized health care, we actually had a guest on last week talking about uh, how Catholics cannot be socialists. Um, wh- wh- why is health care and socialism, why are those two incompatible? Uh, well, the big issue is is who controls the who controls the system, and so with uh, most all the conscience violations we see, where where doctors are forced to you know provide abortions or participate in abortions, you know through a medical school or their certification program, or once they get their doctor's license, you know from the consumer of how there's exemptions for you know wh- whether you do or do not pay for abortion, contraception, or sterilization in your health care, it just it just violates God's natural law. You know, and so as Catholics and Christians, we cannot um, violate God's law and cooperate in evil activities like paying for contraceptions, paying for someone's abortion through health care. You know, the, uh, easy access is one of the big issues. And I, I think we'd all agree that just because you're poor doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to get uh Healthcare. I mean, you don't have to be rich to, to get uh, access to a doctor or something like that. And so uh, that's one of the things that single-payer advocates say is that there's going to be more access. Everybody can have access, kind of like everybody can go to a public school. Is, is there a, a fallacy in that argument? Yeah, there'll actually be uh, less access. You know? And so what's really driving doctors and providers out of the healthcare space right now is just dealing with insurance companies and dealing with the federal government to get paid. And so when you put more government bureaucracies, and it's estimated right now that the average, you know, small family care doctor spends about 40 to 50 percent of their overhead every month on dealing with insurance companies and the government to get paid. And so there's, that's why the doctors are leaving medicine, because just the satisfaction rate is not there anymore, because they're dealing with bureaucracies instead of actually dealing with the patient. And so it's estimated, too, that if a single payer system goes into effect, that you're going to lose about 20 to 25 percent of your your doctors as well. They're just going to leave the industry, you know. And we never do have a problem with the access to healthcare in this country. What, what's happening right now is somebody gets sick, and if they don't have a doctor, they go to the emergency room, which is the most costly way to pay for medical care in this country. It gets to a question: is how do we pay for it? And, and that and get now it still gets back to let's get some transparency in the billing process. Let's try to figure out exactly what things cost in healthcare. And then we can have the consumer pay for it because we have some free market principles guiding it. You know, in my experience and my studying with healthcare, the more the free market is allowed to reign inside um, healthcare, you know, prices go down. And transparency and pricing is the first step. Right now, we have no transparency. We have no free market principles in healthcare because the federal government, the insurance companies are fixing the rates and they don't even know what things cost. Yeah, and I love, you know, uh, the, the very name Solidarity it sounds so Catholic. It has to do with uh, people, uh, you know, coming together, neighbors helping neighbors. Uh, tell us about uh, the connection between the name of Solidarity HealthShare and how that really kind of informs the principles by which you guys uh, do, your, do your work. Yeah, well, we wanted to... ...federal government tell us about how we should, you know, pay for our medical care, especially when it comes to conscience violations. How can we use the Catholic social teaching principle of solidarity, where we come together as a group, as a community, to help our fellow human beings out, our brothers and sisters in Christ out, you know, and be respectful and really help out the common good. And so the other issue, uh, Catholic social teaching doctrine that we really espouse to is the principle of subsidiarity as well, where societal problems can be best solved by those that are most affected, closely affected by the issue, and at the lowest common denominator. So instead of having the insurance companies or, or you know, Medicare rates determine what things are and, and, and access to health care, it should be up to our members. It should be up to you and me, Dave, individually to say, what's best for me and my family? It should be, be the conversation between you and your doctor, you, you, know, you and your provider to decide what's best. 
not some bureaucrat at an insurance company or, or at uh, in the federal government. SolidarityHealthShare.org is the website. Brad Hahn is the CEO. Uh, last question, Brad. Uh, regardless of what happens in November and whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, a socialist or a capitalist, uh, does that impact what you do? I mean, solidarity just keeps on uh, existing and re- remaining an option regardless of who's elected in November, right? Well, no, because if you get a Medicare for all or a social life type medicine, the first thing Bernie Sanders and some of those socialists want to do is to ban any type of private insurance or ban any type of cash pay system we have in this country. So every, every all the care would have to go through the federal government, you know, and there's huge problems there. But, you know, I, I'm very confident in where we're the direction we're in. I'm on a monthly basis. I'm dealing with the White House and key congressional leaders to try to protect health sharing ministry as a federal right of conscience protection. And so I'm confident that even if we do go to kind of socialist government, I still believe in the fundamental principles in this country of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this religious liberty argument that we have is very strong. We may have to go battle in the courts to to exist, but this is a battle we're ready to take just to protect life and to protect an authentic Catholic health care system in this country. Amen. Brad Hahn, thank you so much for your time today. CEO, Solidarity Health Share, a sponsor here on Guadalupe Radio Network. Their website, SolidarityHealthShare.org. Uh, always great talking to you, Brad. Thanks for spending some time with us this morning. Yes, thank you, Dave. God bless. Thanks so much, uh, Brad Hahn there. And we got about 45 seconds uh, to talk about... What do you think, Cecil? Um, uh, that we're going to be on for a little bit longer if you want to continue watching on social media. Aha. Yes, very good. And car uh, raffle. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Those two things. I right? wasn't sure what you were leading uh, me on, so I just went no, with it. <laughs> I, no, I, wasn't, I wasn't, leading the, wasn't leading the witness. I was just kind of like, what do you want to talk about? No, I, I could have no, said I, anything. Actually, I was thinking uh, car raffle, but I'm glad you mentioned that because we're going to continue, and uh, Daniel's going to join us, and you'll get to see behind the scenes here. Uh, keep the conversation going on a little bit more informal of a basis. And so... Uh, uh, thanks to all of our guests and uh, great topics today. Thanks to Diane and Cecil and uh, Dr. Malloy and Daniel. And thank you for listening. And don't forget to buy those car raffle tickets, grnonline.com, or contact your local general manager. The drawing is in seven days. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. God bless you. Have a great uh, first week of Lent, weekend of Lent. Thank you for listening to GRN Alive. From the studios of the Guadalupe Radio Network. For more faith, fun and facts, join our email list. Just text the letters GRN to the number 42828. That's GRN to the number 42828. And may your Friday be filled with the joy of the Lord. Blessed be God, blessed be His holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man, blessed be the name of Jesus, blessed be His most sacred heart, blessed be His most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit of Paraclete. Blessed be the Great Mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Well, now that the 
Hour-long radio program has concluded. We continue on social media, and we thank uh, everybody who's watching us now on um, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. And uh, this is something that Joe and the team down in Houston began months ago, is continuing the conversation in a little bit more informal of a setting. And so I want to thank you for, for being with us. My name is Dave Palmer. Diane Xavier is doing all the social media behind the scenes, and she jumps on with us as well. Cecil Anderson is here as well. She's our uh, on the production team and uh, does the news and the board opping for the GRN Alive. And Daniel DeMore is uh, here as well. He's a young college student uh, studying journalism at a local uh, community college. And he's also an aspiring apologist who uh, sounds like, Trent Horn on the radio, okay? So we really hey. need to start pranking people with that. Or something, <laughs> I, I know. You know? We, we could have Trent Horn on the on with us, and we don't even have to bother getting Trent Horn exactly. up because he's in a like out in San Diego. And uh, well, why why put him through the trouble of waking up so early if we can just <laughs> have you on, right, exactly. Daniel? They, they they won't know the difference. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So. You just quote his book always, and you'll sound like him. So so Daniel has to sit through the show, and uh, he doesn't really, uh, you know. We don't open up the mic a lot for Daniel during the show, but he gets to think and percolate and listen to great guests like uh, Patrick Coffin and Brad Hahn. And so, Daniel, I'm going to go to you first because uh, I, I know you have a lot of thoughts about this. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the first topic as well. How did we get to where we are? What are your thoughts? Okay, well, um, I will say uh, a lot of it had to do with kind of a new philosophy that I think emerged actually from the occult, occult ideas uh, as well as uh, – some philosophers and neuro like people like Sigmund Freud, uh, who were trying to kind of get away from the normal framework of you know God's will be done, and and then there became a new kind of way of thinking about things. It's called "Do what thou wilt," mm. and that that and then there was an occultist from England named Aleister Crowley who basically made that very famous. And uh, a lot of the people, for instance, in the sexual revolution that started in the '60s. Um, were actually big fans of Aleister Crowley. And so that message, do what thou wilt, is the complete opposite of the Christian message, which is God's will be done, mm. not mine. Right. And so basically people now have kind of thrown God away, and basically in this revolution that began over 50 years ago, it's been about me, 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 with uh, do what thou wilt shall mm. be the whole of the law. And that's what I think has led to the downfall of society. Yeah. So almost yeah. reminds me of the quote in scripture when yeah. Satan said, I will not obey. You right. know, mm -hmm. it's like self will, self determination. It really yeah. comes down to the will. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, yeah, you're gonna conform your will to God or are you yeah. gonna say, I'm 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 going at this on my own. So that's that's yeah. really interesting. Uh, I, I do tend to think, you know, these are, you know, symptoms of something, but, uh, and again, I don't think we can point to one moment in history, but I think you got to go back to Descartes, you got to go back to uh, kind of the, um, the, the dissolving of people's uh, faith and belief in Thomistic philosophy, which has kind of been the bedrock of, of, of Catholic philosophy since the, the really the, the 13th century. All right, uh, Cecil, thoughts? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that we can't really necessarily pin it down to one thing. I think that the uh, state of what it is today is a lot of things. I think we've advanced as a culture in a lot of ways, obviously technology and things like that. But we are getting further and further away from that idea that we need God and we need a Savior. And so that makes us be more, uh, oh, I can do this, I can do that. I also think that in the past sometimes we've been, like back in the pioneer days, you know, people weren't probably thinking too heavily on like, am I, do I feel like I'm a man? Do I feel like a woman? Because <laughs> they were trying not to like die from like prairie fires right. or something. You know, they're, So we're bored. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We sense. have a little yeah. too much time to think, uh, uh, and, and, and thinking deeply, we should be thinking about our more, uh, you know, morality. And there are, we should be obviously thinking, uh, but to some extent, I think today we have, too much time and we're doing a little too much you know yeah that's a, that's a really interesting thought and so uh, if you're watching on social media we would uh, appreciate uh, your comments your questions I think Cecil generally is the one that kind of mm -hmm. you're on all platforms yes, and if people has a, have a question uh, join the conversation on YouTube it's GRN online is uh, what you type into Twitter or YouTube or Facebook and uh, you can kind of see behind the scenes and we love uh, your interaction as well it's kind of cool to have a couple of calls during that the show great. today, both from really Houston. That, that was, was nice. Very happy. 
Yeah. So, um, all right. Uh, you look like you're chomping at the bit there, Daniel. What else? <laughs> <laughs> well, are, should we stay on Patrick Cawthorn? Do you want to go to Brad Hahn? What, what, what do you want to keep this? Yeah. Up? Let's. Yeah. Uh, gosh, and I, and I just had uh, yeah. a, a, a thought that it was as Sissa was talking, yeah. a deep, oh. deep thought yeah. uh, oh. with Dave Palmer. About uh, that. <laughs> um, I, so I, I missed a portion of the beginning of Patrick's because I was helping deal with oh. some technical issues. But um, I don't remember if he mentioned in his book so or anything it, okay this is a general question i'm throwing this out here uh for either of you because i'm still kind of a baby catholic to some extent so there's yeah. some things i don't know is there any uh teaching or writing in the church that talks about exactly what it means to be female and what it means to be male in christianity mm. Mm. you know I, I would that's a great question okay. and uh, you know uh, and and uh, our, our budding apologist probably knows this that like the like for the, the doctrine of transubstantiation was mm. not a Officially declared until something like the uh, the the uh, the twelve hundreds, right. and mm -hmm. people say, "Oh, well, then you must not have taught no, that." No, no, right, but, right. But, but I, uh, my point is, is that it wasn't disputed, and as long sure. as something isn't disputed, they don't have to define it, right? Mm -hmm. That's why the Immaculate Conception wasn't uh, defined until the the mid. Uh, uh, 19th century, because that's when it really came to a boil. Mm -hmm. So my point is, is I think that, first of all, I don't know the answer to that question, but secondly, I'm thinking that I, I, I bet you for most of the history of the Church, it's kind of like, had like to duh, had I mean, do we have to say right. that the sun rises in the east and make out in an in a, in a, in a official declaration So that? Some, I'm hoping something maybe in the coming years will have something written up, yeah. maybe, that'll be helpful. Um, yeah, no, because again, yeah, it shouldn't be, but it might be helpful, especially when people are having this uh, crisis of, I, of yeah. gender identity, it would be very helpful to say what is actually, because a lot of things can be seen as personality traits right. when it comes to gender. And, you know, and I'll say, I used to be a, a high school teacher, and I taught for three years at a local Catholic high school here, and I remember in a piece of advice that one of the fellow teachers told me is they, they said, because um, I, I kind of went in thinking, you know, I'm going to make my classroom fun, and we're going to be laughing and joking around and, you know, playing, and, you know, and the teacher said, you know, what the students really want deep down is order. They, they, they want a teacher who's in control. They, want to, they don't want everything going wild. And, you know, and, 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 we, and, and but the reason I'm saying this is that I, I, I find it perplexing the way our culture is because there's a lot of confusion and disorder. Mm -hmm. But I think deep down, who wants that? Do we mm -hmm. really want 58 options on Facebook for gender? Mm -hmm. Or do we just want simply to say I'm a male or a female? So what yeah. Who's pushing for chaos mm. and disorder when we're, we're ordered creatures? You know, we yeah. don't we, we don't want we, we want, you know, lanes going in two different directions on the freeway. We don't really want them to say, hey, let's put a lane in the middle that's going the other direction, kind of mess things up. Let's let's take away stop signs. Let's just let's add chaos to our, our life. I don't who, who who wants that. I don't know. Does that make sense? Mm. I think. Yeah, no, no, it definitely makes sense. Um, I honestly it's probably. I, I see it as it's generally very hurt people who are hurt by that order in some way yeah, or, or a, a disorder of that order, you know, not truly. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's how I see it anyway. Well, I think our natural inclination is to do what we want to do. And that's the thing. So if we were just to let everybody, you know, just chaos, you know, just there's no rules for a day. Everyone would do it. I think like after we kind of get that out of our system, we'd be like, well, gee, this is kind of messed up. It's like, yeah. I, I kind of wish we had order. So, like, we all have that desire to kind of rebel, I think. That's, like, just part of human nature. But, uh, you know, once you get it out of your system, you realize, well, it wasn't really that worth it in the first place to kind of break the law and do this. And then you realize, well, gee, I, I think maybe order is not such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, I think it's a good thing that people kind of – I'm not saying test like the waters, but I'm saying like in a free society, you ca you can do what you want to do. But I think that there's going to be consequences, and as long as people realize that there are consequences uh, from their actions, they can come back to the realization that order is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like sense. almost learning a lesson on something. Well, yeah. it's kind of like with uh -huh. the, with kids and discipline and stuff like that. You know, you say kids want to say like. I don't want any rules in the house, but then you realize, oh, it's not. And especially when you get older and you start doing things that your parents weren't a fan of, and then you're like, not like big things, but, you know, if you do something and, and then you realize, oh, my parents were right. Mm -hmm. You know, you have that moment. Yeah. I've had that moment many times. Like, oh, they had some wisdom there. And, and it's funny you say that because I think there are signs in our culture where people are saying, you know what, the church is right. The church was right. Mm -hmm. Take pornography, yeah. for example. Yeah. You know, you're starting to see even people on the secular side saying, you know what, maybe pornography is harmful to women. 
Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the church has been saying that you know since day one, but mm -hmm. the culture has always been pushing pornography. I, I think there's going to come a time soon when they're going to say, you know what, abort. I mean, it seems like a no-brainer, but abortion is bad. Yeah. Um, you know, marriage is between a man and a woman. Sometimes mm -hmm. it takes a while. You have yeah. to have a period of, um, of of confusion before the the, the people come around. Kind of yeah. like how David mentioned this uh, to David Daniel. I'm sorry, Daniel. Um, okay. Our uh, uh, this is kind of like the uh, teen rebellion stage. Yeah. Of, yeah. of culture at the moment, you know, right. we're kind of let's do everything, all off the limit, all yeah. off limits, no yeah. rules. Kind of yeah. like uh, the 1960s. You ever see mm. the, like like Woodstock? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's just like <laughs> that's that's just craziness. But that yeah. was a reaction, I think, to the 1940s and 50s, where maybe a little too restrictive, yeah, and all of a sudden absolutely. you get the baby boomers kids who are like, woohoo! Yeah. You know, we're gonna <laughs> you know take yeah. our clothes off and smoke dope and hey, and, and, yeah. and drop acid and, awesome. and, and and get naked and it, it's just like really yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know <laughs> and I think maybe we're just going through a big you know rebellious phase so we have been for several decades and I also will say that I think the people who are in control in our country like you you brought up pornography for an example um, that is what well I've heard a lot of stories that say that that's what drove the production of the internet when it in the 90s when it mm. was come to the 2000s was you know at the tip of your fingers you, you just have access to all this free hyper stimulation that and now people are seeing well gee we had all this freedom but now this is actually a big problem there's a lot of people who are really addicted to this stuff and it's ruining their lives and so there's an example right there the America gave people freedom. They didn't ban something that they should have banned a long time ago, and now we can see the detriment it has. I mean, people are viewing it earliest at the age of 11 years mm -hmm. old, and they're still addicted today. So uh, once again, if we had some order there and they decided what should be legal and what shouldn't be legal on the Internet, we wouldn't be in this problem, I think. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> Yeah, good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you want to transition to health care and, sure. uh, well, you know, the, did you watch the debates, the, I, the, the Democratic debates? I, 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 I've, I've gotten to the point where I, I either watch them live or if I'm not able to, I'll, I'll watch the highlights the next day. I find it very I watched interesting. the first one. Okay. I watched the first one and it, and it was pretty funny, actually. There's been like seven of them already, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Really? They're, they're, yeah, they're, 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 yeah, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, they've been a lot. Every time there's like a caucus or a primary, they, yeah. they have a debate. They had one in New Hampshire. They had one in Iowa. They had one in South Carolina. Uh, so, anyways, one of the issues is uh, we talked about socialism last week, so we don't want to focus on that. But now we're talking about Medicare for all, socialized medicine. Thoughts? Um. <laughs> and Daniel looks at me, and I was like, oh. Um, sorry, no, I lost my train oh, of thought, okay. too. Man, deep well, thoughts no, I, happening well, over well, here. Well, I, I, I think, you know, it's it's a nice idea. You know, yes. like if you, ta if you take uh, an idea like, say, um, we're going to pay for all college education, mm -hmm. like, like, like Bernie Sanders, I think, wants to do, yeah. or we're going to pay for uh, child care. It was interesting because he said in the debate the other night something about, you know, the, 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 the age of zero uh, from birth to four is a very, very important age. And that's why we need free child care. And I'm like, really? So Wait, you're going to take them in the most impressionable time of their life and give them to uh, put them outside their family. Wait, well, that, what? That, that, no, that's what that I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically so, what he was said. Was he just saying that just in general that? Every child should be in child care or only when necessary, like when both parents are well, working. Well, he didn't elaborate a lot. And, of oh, course, okay. nobody followed up with it. But not. he's saying yeah. that, uh, you, you know, we, we need we need that free child care because uh, I guess the alternative is they're, you know, at home and the, the dad, the parents are working and they're, you know, smoking cigarettes in the corner. I mean, I, of course, that, that some, somebody's going to take care of them either way, unless you're just a horrible um, parent. Right, Diane? Ahead. Well, the problem is we not to have, I mean... The solution is not to have health care for all. But why is, like, once again, like, college tuition has skyrocketed. Prescription drugs have skyrocketed. You know, medical expenses have skyrocketed. And this is a main problem in the U.S. In other countries, it's not that way. But and not all countries have, you know, so a socialist society. So there's some... Companies like pharmaceutical companies are taking advantage. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. So that's where the problem needs to be. And that's where capitalism, uh, unbridled capitalism, can I be mean, a do you know how much well. an EpiPen costs? An EpiPen. An EpiPen. I don't even like, know what an EpiPen is. An EpiPen is a life-saving thing that people carry who have severe allergies. Oh, okay. And that can be administered on the spot. And people who have severe allergies have one on them always, and it can save their life if they're having an allergic reaction. They're six hundred and fifty dollars. Really? Wow. 
Um, so that was something that recently it used to not it used to be way cheaper than yeah. that. So I saw I've seen articles a, a few months back. I think it's the price skyrocketed. Yeah. And so again, that's like a pharmaceutical company taking severe advantage. This is something people need. Yeah. And there. Well, then this gets to the question of uh, you know human rights. Do we all have a right to health care? Do we all have a right to every part of health care? Let's say. Uh, you know, the the question about if you're 95 years old and you have an ailment, uh, do, 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 does somebody get to decide whether you should, you know, the, somebody, the you know, taxpayer should pay a lot of money to keep you healthy as opposed to a, a 15-year-old? I mean, there's a lot of ethical questions here oh, yeah, that, that come up. I mean, do, do, we all, do we all have a right to a doctor? I mean, uh, is it a human right or is it a privilege? I right. think that that's the distinction. And again, I don't know the answer to it, but mm -hmm. um, you yeah. Know. Well, I, I could connect this to socialism. I think there, there, there becomes it gets kind of dicey when uh, because in socialism everybody's kind of paying for each other, and and that comes back to like the medical industry too. So if we're paying for everything, everyone's medical care, and that includes abortion and things that certain people are do not accept because of their moral standing then basically you have to pay for stuff that you don't even believe in is mm -hmm. right. And I, I think that that's, that is a huge problem with socialism. And not only that, um, but if, if there's like a part of the population that just decides to stop working, for example, well, they're, it's all shared, right? So you're still paying for the government basically to put people on welfare, and you're paying for people who don't work. And, and it's the same thing with the medical industry. You're, you're paying for things that you don't morally accept. So, and that's kind of the direction our country has already been heading in. We've kind of already been doing that. But I feel like with putting a socialist in office, it's just going to be that to the extreme. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we need to get away from that as far as possible. Yeah. You know? I thought it was interesting yeah. when uh, that last question I asked Brad, and I, I really didn't honestly know the answer to it about mm -hmm. uh, does it really matter who's elected in November? Yeah. He basically, yeah. I mean, he said that uh, if we have a socialist who's elected, yeah. Felder de Hellshire is shut down. I mean, he's done. Yeah. That's what he said, because when the government takes over all health care, of course, it wouldn't happen overnight. It would have to be something that uh, was enacted. Right. Yeah. But uh, that, that fundamentally changes our, our country. Yeah. And I've always thought, you know, uh, generosity should be voluntary. I think that uh, in a perfect world, and I think solidarity is as close to this as you can get because it's uh, neighbors helping neighbors, is that, uh, you know, if, if, if you get ill and you don't have any money, I, I should have a moral obligation to help you because I'm a Christian and I'm going to face God one day. But I, yeah. do, I don't really want a government coming to me and saying, you know what, I'm going to take half of your income yeah. away because you need to help Daniel. Right. Because then there's no, there's no moral to that. There's no right. Way. And, if, and if, then they say, if you don't comply, we'll put you in prison. Yeah. Like, that's just wrong. Right. Know? Yeah. Right. And I think, I don't know what you all think about this, but yeah. I feel like if you are not controlling, you know, this generosity, people could be more generous, you know, than like yeah. the government could say, you need to give, let's say, $50,000 to Daniel. Well, you know, or if you on your own could be like, I'm giving 75000 like just by your own goodness, you yeah. know. And so, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, I, I think people are generous by nature. Mm -hmm. I think if, uh, if it, it's, it's interesting because there's, you know, if there's a homeless person on, on the street corner, from my observation, most people don't help them. Most people don't give them money. Some do, but most don't. And I think the reason a lot of people don't is they say, well, there are programs for them. They can go to a soup kitchen. They can go, you know, they, and there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, you know, if you're at the, the mall and somebody falls down and they're having a heart attack, you will see people just surround that person. People yeah. really want to help. And if mm -hmm. I, and I can almost assure you, people would say, hey, this person needs a, a, an Uber ride to the hospital. You know, of course, the ambulance would come. But people would be giving money. People, people are generous. Oh, and, and I can speak from, like, personal experience. My mom had a massive stroke last year and passed away. And in that time, like, the generosity of friends and people we barely knew – what is incredible yeah. like the th where things come from it's kind of it kind of goes back on that thing and i know people who are not christians are going to be like well i can't you know rely on that and i'm always like god will provide you know and, and and things that we wouldn't have even thought about some a, a mom came over to our house and cleaned our house while we were at the hospital yeah just cleaned it top to bottom did all of our laundry that was the most random thing ever but it was incredibly helpful um people paid for us to stay in hotels like all sorts of things you know Ge pe generosity will come out in those situations yeah yeah 
Yeah, I think so, too. And I, I think and then if you're not generous, you can face God uh, uh, and, and God will say, really, you had you, know, you were making, you know, three hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars a year and you weren't helping your neighbors. I mean, you were building that, you know, million dollar house. Seriously. And so I think it kind of works out. And maybe that's the solution. Maybe, um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. If, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Dying Dying. Xavier. Dying. Yes. Well, I think our government, you know, based on my experience, I've had health, major health issues. I had a double organ transplant. Yeah. Our government is very generous. They they pretty much paid for the whole surgery because I, I was put on Medicare, and that pretty much paid for everything. Now, you say but, the government is generous. Yeah, well, the gov- but, but I it, think, it was, oh, in my it situation, because was... I'm thinking, what if they weren't there to put me on Medicare because of my uh, disability? And so they were generous in that way, I think. So, um, but it really I, it isn't what you're saying is the taxpayers were generous because yeah, the, tax, the, the, yeah, well, the, the government took, I mean, and I'm not saying that they did the wrong thing necessarily, but so there it is wasn't help the, the, available. When you say the government was generous, the government got that money from somebody, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so our country is. But, but, uh, it, was, but it, was, it was mandated. It wasn't, yeah. uh, I guess, the point we're making is that if, if you had come to us in a different kind of system and said, yeah, you know, I've got, I need yeah. $100,000. That's where that kind of the whole GoFundMe thing yeah, comes GoFundMe. in, is that you see GoFundMe is kind of what we're talking about. It's a voluntary help. Right. And I think if the government got out of the picture, people would be more generous. Uh, I think that's to your point, yeah. Cecil, yeah. Uh, to the GoFundMe. Yeah, if we step out of it. Yeah. Honestly, the focus should be, it, it, again, I feel like the focus on these sort of things should be on encouraging generosity and in just in general, encouraging people to live out God, God's love. Yeah. Um, if that was the case, we wouldn't like the idea of socialism wouldn't be something that was coming up if people were just naturally like, you know, more generous than we are. Because I know yeah. that we definitely we have times when we're not. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. It's kind of that inner you know, battle that we have between generosity and, and, and selfishness. And so anyways, uh, this is the after show of GRN Alive. Uh, Daniel DeMore and Cecil Anderson, Diane Xavier and me, Dave Palmer. Just a few minute, more minutes remaining. Uh, uh, are we we're ready for closing statements? Yeah, uh, I just want to say the U.S. is one of the most generous countries in the world. I mean, we're known to be, just give internationally and locally here in the States. So I think, you know, that's one good thing. Uh, many uh, one of many good things about our country is that we're very generous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. All right, Daniel. Anything else? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, we are we are a very generous country, um, but there's also it's it's one thing to be generous, but you also have to have wisdom in mm-hmm. your generosity. So right. how you distribute that and what it's going towards. So. It, for, for instance, what our government does to subsidize health care, it can be very helpful in certain people's situations, but it, can't, it isn't helpful in every situation. So we have to make sure that we give the people a say, and it's not just the government controlling everything. Mm-hmm. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and also, you know, yeah. what is health care? People are yeah. now uh, claiming, you know, yeah. sex yeah. transition, uh, right. uh, you know, operations. People like even, you know, prisoners, uh, you know, saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a man. I want to become a woman. Well, that's health care, so we're yeah. going to give that. Abortion is health care in some people's yeah. minds. Right. Yeah, like, kind of like what Brad Hahn said. He says, well, you know, it's who, who's in charge of that, who's, who's making the decisions on where yeah. that money is going, you know, yeah. sort of thing. So, All yeah. right. Well, I think that kind of wraps it up. Uh, and uh, appreciate everybody sticking with us in the after show uh, and with GRN Alive. Uh, we'll see you next week. Next week, the big drawing for Woo! the Cadillac CT5. Uh, that's going to be exciting. Uh, the drawing will be done from. We have, uh, well, I, I say a week. It's only until Monday, right? Yeah, it's really only. <coughs> Hold on, math escaped me. I was like three, four days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so three days. So three Friday, days. Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Yeah, three more days three to more buy days. tickets. Uh, Monday is it, and so get your tickets before Monday, and uh, you can do it online, grnonline.com, or else contact your local general manager, and uh, he will be happy to get you some <laughs> tickets. But you got to be quick. Yes, uh, be quick. And so, anyways, thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Cecil. Of thanks, course. Diane. And thanks everybody for watching and listening today with GRN Alive. Uh, that'll do it. God bless you. My bad.